Good afternoon. I, 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 I think really this should, talk should be given by a design historian because um, not, I, I don't really like talking particularly about my own work, but because it covers, a, the work covers a, a long period of 50 or 60 years and it's very difficult to uh, understand the conditions in which um, any particular work was made. Um, I read something this morning that I'd written saying it's much more important to study one work in depth than it is to look at a lot of things, but unfortunately there's not really time to do that. So I've put together a lot of images um, of work um, to try to cover uh, the whole um, period of, uh, of work from the 1950s. And it's very difficult to understand the circumstances in which any individual work was done. So um, while it could be done by a design historian, at least there's the opportunity when the designer is still anyway, just about alive to, for him to give the answers to any questions about um, why a work looks like it does. So I think the important things when you're looking at any graphic work is the social circumstances in which it was done and that is the general uh, social political environment but also the relations with the designer has with the client and the client's general relationship to life. Now um, the other aspect of course is after the social is the technical that's to say to understand how something was in fact produced and during the period in which I was working, things changed enormously because designers were in those days working mainly with their hands. It was a physical activity. Also, it was a matter of talking a great deal, not merely with the client, but with the people who were actually producing what was generally speaking printed work. Um, so that there, designer was producing instructions, written instructions, and was using the telephone, which was thought to be almost the, the most important tool, because they would be talking to printers, to people who were making, who were block makers, that's to say, photo engravers, and of course the pe printers and paper merchants. So, um, what I'll do is, is quickly go through things. The reason for showing this picture is simply because when Emily King, the curator of the exhibition at Artist Space, um, because she was giving the, a talk in uh, the Pompidou and I wasn't there, I wanted to be present in some form. And I, it was interesting, I thought, to show that, in fact, I was surprised um, that um, I had an elder brother and he took this photograph of me at the beginning beginning of the Second World War, where I was, um, the, my whole school was evacuated from London to the south coast, and I'm sitting on a gun emplacement, in fact, but painting. And this is what I went on doing, and in a sense have gone on doing for, <laughs> for a long time. Now, um, one of the, if, if you, talk about how this was done. This is just the simplest form of communication, a direct making of collage is obviously influenced by, um, uh, by someone like Schwitters, who was amazingly popular in the late 1950s with uh, a few people of my generation. Um, and of course Schwitters, his son was then around in, in London and um, doing his um, father's um, Ursanata. And so we had direct connections with, with people from an earlier generation. And this is simply a, a two sides of a postcard sent to my then girlfriend. And the reason for going in to um, Morocco was just, was I was interested actually in modern architecture and in social housing. So it was, to, and I took photographs of which this is one. At the same time, People whom I was at school with went on to university when I went on to art school. So when they went up to uh, the Edinburgh 
fringe, I was able to do posters such as this, influenced by probably by American designers. Now, in fact, some, uh, when I say that we work with our hands, in this case, this was printed by me as, a, as in silk screen, and the stencil for this was all cut by hand. Um, I did evening classes at the Central School in typography, and one of the um, teachers there said, oh, do you want a job? Would you like to, to do, thing, do the programs and things for Sadler's Wells? Well, I'd never done any typography before, but I was able to, in a way, to improvise. This was an invitation card where you couldn't print a half tone. I printed this myself, set the type myself, and printed it myself on a tiny um, uh, printing machine. And most of the time, of course, designers were working from home because there weren't design groups, and designers would, would be working for, if, if they were outside the home, one or two for publishers, but otherwise in advertising agencies, or the worst uh, were commercial art studios. And the next thing I did was work as an art printer for this artist called Michael Rothenstein. This was figurative art, and this was the heading for, a, the, for an Arts Council film about his printmaking. And again, I did, uh, influenced by I think American abstract expressionist painting. This again is a silk screen poster where the lettering is, the stencil is cut out from myself, by, by myself, and actually the lettering is taken from, a, a, from a, a, one of these billboards that's put outside a news agent. Now, the sort of figurative work that Michael Rothenstein was doing didn't interest me because I was interested in geometrical serial painting, that's to say, things which were determined by, by numbers. So that in fact, these stripes, the width of them, there's only the smallest unit is one unit, and you either had three or two. And the repeti there's a repetition, the right-hand side is simply a repetition of the left-hand side. And so it was just a, a, a statement which had an aesthetic element in it. At the same time, I was becoming a typographer, I suppose, and I, well, this was a catalogue for the British Iron and Steel Federation films, which um, a job that was given me by some publishers, because all my work, almost, it's all, uh, the people I've worked for, it's all been, they've either been friends or it's done by word of mouth, that somebody said, oh, go to him, or so on. I've, I haven't, I only had once the horrible business experience of trailing around with a portfolio. Um, this was obvious, they printed with a single colour across the whole of the background and then just black on top. Now, in those, at that, at that time, to get this sort of uh, grotesque typeface, what's now called accidents grotesque, you had to order it specially from Wales. And th things, you had to make demands on the uh, print, on the print uh, medium, really, on the, on the whole, um, in, on the print industry, in fact, to get them to do what you wanted, because it was not what they were used to doing. Most things then were designed by printers, not by designers. Now, uh, I was taking photographs, and I, a friend, I'd begun teaching by this time, I'd, quite by chance. Most young designers did a day a week at the, in teaching in an art school. And with a day a week's teaching, they could actually, they were able then to survive because living in those days was extremely cheap. Rents, food, everything was far, 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 far cheaper than it is now. So somebody had said to me, why, you know, um, and it's very, in what's going on in Cuba is very interesting. There's, they're, they're doing away with money and you know, what? And so I thought, oh, well, when the term ended, I was then teaching at Chelsea and so I, left as soon as I could, almost before the summer term ended, because there was no third year uh, at the time, because graphic design hardly existed. And so I went to Cuba and made um, a record of what I did by taking photographs, um, making negatives in, with a screen on them, putting these together as film makeup on a, a glass table with light underneath, and had this 
printed and just used um, a rubber stamp and a felt pen in the corner to um, put the title on. And this is just typical of one of the photographs that I took at the time, partly to record the sort of graphics that was uh, being done then. And at the same time, or just soon after this, I was working for Penguin and got to know at this time all the pictures in the picture agencies so that you could go to somewhere in Fleet Street and go through all their boxes of photographs because they would be classified under, there would probably be one under Cold War or Russia or something, so that you could go through all those and find the pictures that you wanted for a particular job. In this, the way this was done was trying to make a, an argument that there, there's an East German border guard with a camera photographing into West Berlin, and so on the back cover there is a photograph of the kind of protest that the West Berliners were making, holding up placards. So there's a kind of little story. Um, this is a different sort of story, Bertrand Russell. Most young designers were very anxious to work for um, libertarian or you could say protest groups so that the um, campaign for nuclear disarmament was something which I worked for, but with, of which Bertrand Russell was the sort of patron saint. And um, this is simply a penguin special. Again, it's simply a question of finding the right documentary image to put across the idea. Here I was able to use a Cartier-Bresson photograph. And in those days, another example of how it was different was you could go to the Magnum archive in, in Paris and just look through all Cartier-Bresson's contact sheets, which nowadays would be unthinkable. You, you would have access to them on, on the um, on, on screen, but it would be a completely different experience from seeing what was then chosen to be printed from the Cartier-Bresson negatives. And fortunately, Cartier-Bresson photographs you can't crop, so for the proportion of the um, penguin cover, it was possible not to crop the photograph by having the type going out, still going over the photograph at the top using what was then the, the pelican colour. And this is uh, another typical penguin cover. Most penguin covers lasted for a few months and then if the book was reprinted they had another cover on the hope that, that not because the directors thought it was necessarily bad or wouldn't sell the book but just because they wanted to make it look as though they'd got yet another new book. So that these are typical of the kinds of, um, but that would have been a keystone photograph um, at, at the bottom. And all this would be done as pasted up artwork. These were all letterpress printed covers. Some of the, the few commercial jobs I did, this was people who imported well, for example, Alto Furniture, they, were, it was, they had basically Scandinavian stuff and the um, Finmar Logat, the symbol, which is on the left-hand side, which makes an F, but is also like a fir tree, was done by one of the immigrant um, designers, that, it, Hans Schlager, because many of the designers who my generation admired were people who had come, um, had fleeing... Um, Nazi Germany and had come before the war and this was this was it, the inside of a furniture catalogue for Finmar where you can see the influence of uh, Swiss design. Um, I then uh, went to work in Paris for the publicity studio of Gallery Lafayette and Generally speaking, I, I would say I tended to be a, a formal designer, not a, a conceptual designer. Whereas um, an American designer would say, uh, teaching as he did at the Central, would say to a student, what's your concept? And if you couldn't tell the concept over the telephone, then you hadn't got an idea, you know, you, that you were pretty well hopeless. So that this is an influence of um, the American new advertising. Now, when I was working in Paris, um, a designer called Norman Potter, a, a three-dimensional design, furniture design, designer, 
uh, got in touch with me and he was teaching at the Royal College and he said, we think, I think maybe we could start an, a sort of Bauhaus type of design school in, in Bristol. If you apply to be head of graphics, I'll apply to be head of um, three-dimensional design. And that was what happened. So for two years, we attempted to um, make a different sort of design education, which was partially successful because we combined three-dimensional design and graphic design on the basis that three-dimensional designers most of spend so much of the time uh, actually drawing. And of course, all the, the work which a designer does, so much of it is questioning a client about what it is actually they are trying to do. So that the training and asking questions, how to we also we even had classes in in English, um, a whole day spent on the English language because this was regarded as being important to designers. However, I I only after two years and it was extremely difficult to do this in in Bristol. Though Norman Potter, who wrote this book, what is a designer, he stayed on for some time and did in three dimensional design make uh, an important contribution. And this was the sort of work that I did that, you know, just improvised things for small theatre things. And then after I'd been in Bristol, I went to work for, which we'll see later, a, a weekly uh, magazine, New Society, um, for really for about social work more. Although it was it had many cultural aspects, it had theatre reviews, book reviews and, and so on, which were much more general, not focused just on social work. However, this is, I'm there on the left teaching at, at the Central School, which I began to do, I think, one evening a week and eventually taught part-time in two bursts, um, uh, two, I like, for two years and then uh, with a gap and then for another three years in the, I think it must be in the 70s. Now, when I first started teaching, I was fortunate that I shared a class at London College of Printing with somebody who'd been a Bauhaus student. So when I mentioned this connection with earlier generations, it was absolutely the fact. And then when I was at the Central, it was possible to ask some, someone who'd been a Bauhaus student to talk to students about the Bauhaus. And one of my colleagues, Anthony Frosshau, who had taught at the Ulm uh, School in Germany, was able to talk about the Ulm School. So students had a, a, a pretty good idea of the sort of history of design education, which they could in fact compare with their own. This again was part of the movement to try to reform uh, design education, for which I did a poster. Um, I'm, I have, uh, I'm not absolutely convinced that what happened in the loosening up of design education so that, uh, that so much more was done on a, uh, by making graphic, or not making, but allowing graphic design students, for example, to do ceramics for one day a week and sculpture for another day a week so that everyone was doing everything. It meant that nobody learned anything very much. This, was a, this is a gener harsh generalisation. A new society, which was a weekly, it meant doing things very quickly, so it was simply printed on newspaper printing presses and one had to improvise something. This is an inside um, spread. It was something about the spread of d dance and the history of dance. So it's simply a question of finding documentary images, again using uh, picture agencies, finding books uh, from which images could be taken and telling a sto story which in fact enlarges what is written and that's one of the most interesting things that I've worked on as um, you'll see with books and this is the history of um, uh, punishment and sometimes I made uh, collages to go this was something about uh, Ma Malinowski um, the anthropologist. So I made a picture and combined images. This was for 
something where John Berger I met through because he was a writer for New Society and this was a, a cover done for him and when the Soviets invaded the Czechoslovakia I just heard on the radio that this graffito had been done so I just immediately made the, the graffito for the front of the of the magazine and this is another they were these the things which, if you imagine that you're doing 52 issues a year, you're doing an awful lot of covers, but of course, many of them I commissioned outside, but we, and designers just had to do these over the weekend. Um, and also there were things which had to be designed incorporating statistics. You see a table on the far right. This was a, an article about um, suburbia and how suburban life could be made to work as, as a community and so I commissioned a photographer to take photographs of people in uh, suburbia but trying to use their hands to, um, demonstrate, to somehow give an idea of different aspects of life in suburbia. This went on over several pages. Um, New Middle East was another magazine that I worked for and um, here I joined together documentary photographs to show the move that um, the Egypt was taking, moving from Western influence to um, Eastern European, Russian influence. And so you see Sadat embracing uh, Khrushchev on the right and Golda Meir meeting Brezhnev on the bottom, so that it's a kind of mini history uh, you see New Middle East on the left. I also worked for a print union journal, which, on, which you see on, on, on the right. So you can get, in a way, a lot of this work shows some of the history uh, of the period. Now, um, around the time, uh, I will, uh, one of the uh, people I knew, I lived above uh, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Path for a time, so when Ted Hughes started um, this magazine, Modern Poetry in Translation, with one of his uh, friends. I had this idea that I had read that in, in Latin America they handed a, um, poetry out in the street for nothing. I made this, it printed on Bible paper in a very large format so that it could be sent abroad and cost uh, very little to send. It's just a letterpress thing. And this magazine developed. I worked for it actually for 40 years, so you can imagine how many covers I did if there were four a year. Um, and it changed its format a great deal. You can see on the far right, it, we actually took it down to a very small size, always trying to save money. And one of the things that I noticed that I, that is a, an aspect of the work is that all, I was always interested in getting as much out of the budget as, as possible. Um, of course, printing in two colours wasn't using a big budget, but by using coloured papers, you could somehow make uh, an effect of, 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 of greater, um, not exactly luxury, but making it richer. This is a typical cover, this um, for an issue on Poland, using it was actually a student's photograph. I thought it looked a bit Polish, uh, in, but it, because he had a Polish name, and it says photo by uh, uh, Czerniawski, it um, looked as though it was an authentic document from Warsaw. <laughs> uh, one um, device was also reusing photographs. On the left-hand side, there's a photograph of Bologna, which I just pinched from another book that I designed about Bologna. And on the right-hand side, this is just an image for these kinds of things using blown up stamps was a very useful device to find an image as I very rarely drew. At this time I began to work for the Whitechapel Art Gallery. There's rather a lot of Whitechapel stuff now. I'll go through it fairly quickly. This was the first letterhead. Now this is really the introduction to an obsession with folding um, and you'll see that from this you can actually fold this piece of paper into, you can fold it down the middle and the fold doesn't go through any of the type. 
It would, of course, by the time the letter was actually typed on. Now, all the lettering for the Whitechapel for years was done by photographically, by, by making lots of prints of lots of alphabets and cutting them up. So all the headings were done, pasted up letter by letter. And at, those, at that time, this, I photographed these things on my desk. Um, and you can see the sorts of things. The nearest we got to anything automated was in the top right-hand corner, you can see a calculating machine. But then all the other things are things which were used for sticking, for magnifying, uh, for colouring. So you've got poster paint. Because if you were producing a rough design for, say, a penguin book, you were using poster paint often to show the colour of the background. So it was altogether a physical activity and drawing. Now the Whitechapel, um, this was before I adopted A sizes for it. Posters were sent out, rolled up, and I thought this is crazy because it's expensive. And so all the posters we began to send out so that they could be sent out folded. Now, the structure of the typography at the top of this, you can see that it actually went down to fold into a business envelope, so-called DL size. Um, you'll see th how that worked later. This is just the cover to a, um, to a catalogue. This is the inside of that catalogue. It was printed in um, maroon type on um, on a greyish paper, and then the inside page is printed on art paper. This is all letterpress, and all the people were, are in circles, and when, the, that's to say the designers of the furniture are in circles, and whenever the, their words are quoted, the quote begins with a circular, um, a, a circular O uh, type. This was a um, a post of, and an, in fact, a private view invitation for a David Hockney exhibition. What happened in this case was that the poster was printed with large type all over the bottom section. And when the director, Mark Glazebrook, said, oh, the, phoned me up and said, oh, the posters have arrived, Richard, I said, yes, I've seen one. I think they're terrible. He said, oh, dear, uh, we'd better do them again. So he came around and, um, oh, what are we going to do about it? the type? Well, I designed a an advertisement for one of the art magazines. And so I cut the type off that and added this blob at the bottom in case nobody noticed it. And um, um, down at the bottom right um, is, you can see, it says private view and then it says the date. So that this would be printed, just one printing on the press, then the, they would stop the press and the, where it says private view, that would be taken off, the, um, taken off the plate and then it would be run on and it would be just a poster. Uh, this was the front of the catalogue, still this pasted up letter by letter, this block type. I chose this block type because I thought it was something which uh, fitted in with the are our arts and crafts character of the original building. And this is the inside of the catalogue. When Hockney is quoted, he always spoke in, in Rockwell, and the type it's, and the catalogue editorial always spoke in um, what's now called Accidents Grotesque. Patrick Heron, this was a poster derived from one of his prints. Often I work directly with with the artist as often as possible because the artist working on a catalogue can usually say what he or she likes or doesn't like and can help generally in establishing what is important. This was done for the artist Derek Beauchard. It was a, both a poster and a sort of catalogue which folded up, again printed in two, two printings. This would have been offset, not letterpress. The first uh, job I did when um, uh, Nick Sorota arrived at the Whitechapel was this is the front of a catalogue he did, which was um, always done as, done absolutely as cheaply as possible, all done by 
all this was pasted up um, so that it was all done ready for the printer's camera. So that everything had to be made on the camera in the studio to the appropriate size. There you see, this is some, uh, Bob, now I think called Bob Graham, who had a show at the Whitechapel. And he, having seen the blob that was put on the David Hockney poster, which was just there to make it look bigger, said, oh, oh gee, I like your logo, and which was in fact just this stroke, which was this bar, a uh, diagonal bar, which really came influenced, I think, by uh, Lichtenstein's uh, abstract expressionist brush stroke. Now, this gives a better idea of how the Whitechapel stuff was sent out. That's it, you can see how the poster in the background was folded, so that the folds didn't go through the type. And the invitation card and the newsletter were folded or sent out in the same envelope. So that everybody on the mailing list got a poster, which is A3, and they got an invitation card and they got the newsletter. This is the front of a newsletter. This sort of texture of the uh, Eric Gill sculpture on the right is obtained by using a particular screen on the process camera which breaks it up, breaks up the image, not into regular dots, but into a, a rather random pattern. Um, this is a, uh, again a, a poster which folded so the folds didn't go through the through through any of the lettering and the image on the right you see is, is just this is printed from you can see the blue and the orangey red which printed together as a duotone produced something like a slightly warm black or sepia image but it's only two printings and by putting different sorts of tint on the type you could actually articulate the meaning of the type. So the sights and sounds of then the Jewish East End is really the most important thing together with the white chap. So the rest of it's as though the voice was lowered in when you're saying the sights and sounds of and at the. This was a, a gallery guide again as these were given out free in the gallery. Not, not sent out, they were A, A4. Again, using two, using just the red and the green, because the red and the green print, overprinted produce uh, a, a pretty good black. This is the f front of the catalogue. This is the inside of the catalogue, all one of the last jobs, big jobs, printed letterpress. This was, um, I thought uh, Anthony Gormley was was uh, sculptor Cragg, and I, because Tony Cragg broke up um, or made his um, images on the wall out of pieces, and I thought he was Anthony Gormley, but <laughs> neither of them minded particularly. Um, I did several things involved in the, the with them. Um, racism in the East End, which was the, it, although this wasn't directly connected with the Whitechapel, this was um, the front of a, a kind of booklet that went with an exhibition. And there were two of these, one about Auschwitz in general and one about uh, racism in the East End. That all, all this is pasted up by hand very, very cheap to produce, printed on newsprint. Now, I also worked for Pluto Press, uh, which was um, a left-wing um, publishers. Um, and this book um, hazards of work, I hope I've got images of it, um, but this is the advertising that was done for this book. And there you can see a reproduction of the book. Now, this is a real pocket book. It was designed literally to go in the some in an overall pocket. And this is the front of it. Now, the typographic language of this book was 
the typographic language of the Sun and the Daily Mirror because the people using this will be used to seeing text which was broken up into bold and um, bo into bold uh, italic and in very short paragraphs so I used this in this case to um, give people small amounts of information at a time and to make it very accessible. Going back to that and this book actually was it was held up in when Michael Foote was leader of the Labour opposition he, he actually held it up because of the way in which um, hazards at work were, were, were dealt with by the health and safety executive and it's still a major problem and recently I've been in touch with the health and safety executive to see what is the equivalent material they produce and of course it's produced entirely for the employers to prevent them being sued if things go wrong if there are accidents or people are poisoned um, this is typical of the things that, would, that I did for the Pluto Press books and uh, sometimes it was possible to use the back and make it more interesting or as interesting put lots of information and even on the spine of the book because if a book is on the shelves in a booksellers then people will see the spine see uh, writing on it and since presumably if they're in a bookshop they're going to be reading I think they're interested in text this was the an idea which I used occasionally the typical Pluto press cover they're again making a link between the front and the back so that almost the in picking it up in a bookshop you would know quickly what it was about you would feel obliged to read it and you you can see the way in which the words on the spine the gorillas actually it's over there that the this red band goes this is just the type inside showing how how crude really the this the work was at this time um, printed letterpress on but from rotary plates um, this is a for the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford this is a a poster which folded in four again to go in an envelope using um, Pollock's writing and images of him working and his, the work itself now I did a series of posters for the African National Congress um, someone rang up and said would I do them because he didn't want to do them and so these were just improvised by typesetting with an IBM golf ball typewriter I think I'll show that in a minute and pasting everything up um, and then it was be photographed by the printer again in in two colors so you do two separate layers one for the green and one for the black and in this case I always used a small part a detail of the larger image because it was called International Year of the Child I always had one child isolated as an image as the second image in, in the, these posters um, and there you can see the child you can just about see in the bottom picture he's standing up against corrugated iron wall and there he is at, at the top so he the words the child come next to the image of the child and this is the sort of camera that designers had in their studios usually in a, in a dark room or in a cupboard or they had some way of keeping it dark it had to always been used just for enlarging and reducing tracing but with the coming of photographic transfer paper you could actually make photo prints and make screened photographs so that all the print had to do was re-photograph everything and this is the golf ball typewriter and this is what the golf ball typewriter produced but when you were typesetting on it this word spacing was so great that you always had to backspace between each word so Pink Floyd was uh, I worked for doing various things um, 
this was a, a, a letterhead as straightforward as it could be. The, the, the style of the type was taken from the, they had, one of them had blousons with that sort of, sort of lettering on. So I took that as the standard thing. And they had this, the, they had a recording studio called Britannia Row, which also leased out recording equipment and uh, huge things for gigs. And this um, uh, sort of brochure was showed the sort of equipment they leased out. Uh, a young person who went asking for trying to get an internship at Britannia Row, which still exists, um, this was actually in a frame on the wall. And this fellow said, oh, my girlfriend works for that designer. And he said, what, is he still alive? <laughs> So it, it was, I don't know, in the early 80s, I should think. And something which looks simple for something like that um, is actually can be immensely complicated. If people are ordering equipment for a gig and all this sort of thing has to be done in duplicate, it's an enormous amount of work to organise this sort of thing. Now, in the recording studio, I with a friend, we letter-setted every single jack point in the recording studio. And the mixing desk, we also letter-setted, and we had the letter-set made using that typeface, and in a, not in white, of course, in, in a cream colour. And every single letter and numeral was then individually varnished by us. So it gives you an idea of how hands-on things were then. These were um, t-shirts that were done for Britannia Row roadies and this was to also I enjoyed uh, wordplay that so that for Britannia this I don't know whether you get this this is sans les lumières uh, not spelt in the French way um, which may have attracted attention I don't know so that this interest in language actually was partly stimulated by something I worked on, I should think, in, in the 80s to help, particularly with dyslexic children, so that we gave diacritical marks to every different sound. Now, when, for example, the person who organised this uh, um, woman teacher in where well, she would have a whole group of primary school teachers together and would say now how many vowels are there in English and they'd all say five or what or some might say seven. Twenty-one and don't you forget it and in fact to make the different sounds we had to give the teachers books which had got guidebooks which showed how in a particular circumstance the letters were produced and um, what what sound you had to identify the sounds and this helped them analyze what problems individual uh, pupils children were having um, with them um, and this was part of the teachers guidebook this was just the cover to it this again shows which was much earlier uh, 71 72 National Book League had an exhibition of four writers who were also um, painters. So next to the, each picture I put the comma to stand in for, for their writing, whereas the image, that they were all self-portraits, stood in for them as visual artists. Now one of the things I'm also interested in, or have been interested in, is economy. Now this is a a single poster for two exhibitions at the Crafts Council Gallery. So for a woodworker on the left, woodcarver, and for a general exhibition of domestic pottery on the right. Now, the central type, which was there, you see, is wipe, has been wiped off the plate so that this each exhibition, when it toured, could have a separate poster and the, the individual venue could put in their own information in the blank space that is left. 
even more economically on the back of those posters was the catalogue for each exhibition. This is for David Pye, the woodcarver, and this was for the domestic pottery. So that from one, one piece of paper came all these different items. This was a poster for an exhibition. I had the idea at the time of having lots of things on the same poster because if they were on the underground, people were, uh, would have something to puzzle over. This was the exhibition that, um, for, which was done for the British Council, which was a travelling exhibition. This just gives you an idea of the way in which I might have been working in trying to sort out how something like this was organised, how to show all these photographs in a way which could then be packed up to go into, a, into an aircraft hold. Every, everything that is actually solid there became the actual packing cases into which all the photographs and everything else went so that um, there was no extra packing cases. The packing cases was all part of the exhibition. Um, also, for I did a book for uh, Macmillan's uh, about Godard, and um, this was extremely complicated in the sense that this, before I worked with a computer, of course, this all had to be pasted up with photographs, unscreened photographs, bromide prints to size pasted in position. Now you can see on the left hand side that space had to be left for these. So the calculation of where the typesetting went to a different measure was <laughs> extremely tricky and the writer Colin McCabe was still working on this. I was pasting up chapters before while he was still writing other chapters towards the end. And it meant seeing absolutely every Godard film so that I knew what was what and could assemble the images in the correct relationship to the text. It was, as you can see, it's just done on a very simple three column grid. Him, um, the Bridget Riley, I worked with a, a good deal on all kinds of different books and catalogues. This I show you because when Bridget Riley had an exhibition, a retrospective exhibition at the Tate, in the catalogue I didn't want to have small paintings reproduced bigger than larger paintings. So I had to work out all the, the relative sizes of all the images. Um, and this is the diagram that I did where I've um, made a scale representation of all the paintings that we were going to reproduce. And this is the inside of the catalogue. There's a lot of typographic detail, of course, in something like this. Another artist I worked with much more recently And I want, uh, this is Steve McQueen. Now, he came to, to me with um, somebody from his gallery, Thomas Dane, and said, oh, I want to make a book with the, you know, stamps of the, all the soldiers who were killed in the Iraq war, because he was the official war artist. So, um, I said, OK, and I said, well, why don't you, you don't, do you want, really want a book? And I said, why, you know that in the, in the so-called King's Library, in the British Museum, they have stamps where you pull out them out on a slide. I say, couldn't you do it like that? He said, great idea, man. So <laughs> that was how, that was how this <laughs> emerged. And of course, I mean, it was a most, uh, it was a most, uh, I mean, it was a huge job and a rather difficult job because it meant having the next of kin send photographs of, of 
family soldiers who had died and some of them were of course you know they were holding their children and so on. so that I had to photoshop all of these to size and then I got someone else to put them into the into the sheets but in fact it wasn't quite that because while they have a black border around them I had assumed that the actual wood would be stained black but um, it wasn't and so it wasn't what I would have how I would have liked it but this was the sort of thing so that I've forgotten there were about 150 of these sheets which I had to get printed in duplicate um, this is a much earlier poster for um, modern art Oxford again I was trying to give people a good idea of what the exhibition was likely to contain who Eisenstein was and what he did this was another Museum of Modern Art thing in which and this is something which was in fact never used and I had to redo it because when the Japanese embassy saw it they said we are not this sort of violent nation but in fact if you see the image on the top left is, is exactly an extremely violent image but they plainly you couldn't do this to what was seen as the Japanese uh, symbol now John Berger, whom quite by chance when I was a student at, at Chelsea had been one of the people who came in in the evening teaching drawing and um, he was as I've said a writer for New Society magazine and wh when I first met him he said oh I'm doing a novel it's going to be like, um, like uh, Andre Breton's Nadja it's going to have images in it in fact there were virtually no images in it but I pasted up the whole book which is a very unusual for a novel although it was printed letterpress I pasted up all the galleys and sat with him and I was able to say well you know this doesn't fit terribly comfortably could you cut this and he would yes say okay because he was used to being a journalist and having um, um, editors make you know reduce text enormous amount this is a cover which with two printings just the black and the blue I used every there's white out of black there's black on blue there's uh, and there's white out of blue and there's so and there's just blue out of black so I throughout this it showed it does almost every variation that you can use with two printings This is the inside of the book. When I, I sat with Berger picking the, choosing the photographs and putting them together and um, making cuts and, and, and so on. So it, it was kind of a collaborative job. These two, the torn photograph is that the, when the, an immigrant would arrive from Turkey and Germany, he would have left part of a photograph with his family and he would send the other half back to the family to show that he had actually arrived and nobody could be pretending that and this is an obvious juxtaposition I and mean, what um, in using images as a designer one's constantly using um, contrasts of new and old now and then and so on this is John Berger on television doing the programs ways of seeing and this is the front of the book which came out very soon after the programs went out on there and the idea of using bold type was simply to make the reader read the type at the same time as the images because art books at that time tended to be a lot of text and plates which weren't necessarily put together and in this case it was meant to be have the same effect as if you were looking at the television screen that's to say that you could have words and images at the same time obviously you can have a voiceover on television images you can't plainly do it um, in print but this was the nearest I could think of getting to it and and if you look at the bottom right hand side it says that 
This is a landscape of a cornfield with birds flying out of it. Look at it for a moment, then turn the page. And then at the top, this is the last picture that Van Gogh painted um, before he killed himself. Um, so that the actual structure of the book um, helped engage the reader. This has now been lost since Pe Penguin has recently disastrously reprinted this book and mucked all the pages around so that not only does this not happen, but the, it is so badly bound that you can't open it and the, the foreword is at the back. A lot of the time I've also been writing um, about the history of design, in which this talk could be a sort of chapter. Um, because in a way, I think there have been so many wonderful designers who've preceded us that it's, I've always wanted to make a, it's a sort of homage to them. But because I was teaching and gave lectures about the history of design, uh, I really needed a sort of textbook. And the, because when I was young, several of us went, if we admired somebody, it was to, America was a long way to go. Whereas if you admired Swiss designers, you could just go and see them and talk to them. And they were so helpful that, um, and of course I admired them and I was interested in making a book, um, partly while they were still alive, because I could talk to them. And um, um, some of them I'd met, of course, in, in the, at the end of the 50s. And um, so this was really a homage to them, although much of their most interesting work, of course, had been done before the Second World War. Now, what this involved, of course, in the amount of work while designing was actually this sort of thing, which is just some of the files of things, because it meant going through, you know, working in the library in Zurich and visiting the um, archives in Basel and so on, apart from going not just to Basel and Zurich, but going to places to which some of the older uh, designers had retired to interview them. And the most recent book I did this was, well, was put together of all the things that I'd written over various, uh, over the years. This is the last picture because it's, this is French students visit, talking in my workroom and looking at work. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't show you real things, but um, anyway, thanks very much.